Welcome everybody to my first live stream. Uh, I have been spending a lot of time at home working with many people uh, in the journalism, actually. And I kind of really liked connecting people, getting to uh, find out useful information and connecting people with those faces, those individuals who we want to connect most. And I'm so honored to have Vincer as my first ever guest in this channel. Vint, welcome. How are you? Much, uh, it's always a pleasure. And of course, uh, everyone now is experiencing internet in a, a new way, uh, given that we're all largely forced to distance ourselves in the face of this uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, so actually, I'm relieved that the uh, internet seems to be holding up pretty well, despite the fact that uh, a great deal of demand is being placed, especially bi-directionally, that is to say, people have to be able to push uh, video streams out in addition to consuming them, as many people have been, uh, as uh, online streaming has become so popular. Vint, first of all, uh, I, I would like to start with a question regarding, uh, you know, we, we, I'm a follower of you in Twitter uh, and may, any other social media you are, and you're very active, as we know. Uh, how are you doing uh, after COVID-19? I read your great article as well in Forbes, and which was very amusing to you know understand what you've been going through. We would like to hear from you a couple of your uh, you know notes about how how everything went. How are you feeling now? How is your wife? So uh, well, first of all, I have to disappoint everybody and explain that this was not too dramatic. Um, we had very light cases in terms of symptoms. Uh, in fact, mine uh, were worse than my wife's, uh, and I just had, you know, some dry coughing and a headache, and then uh, a, an elevated temperature, and then chills, all within about a 24-hour period. After which I was simply exhausted, and it took probably three weeks to regain energy levels, and that was probably the most palpable um, uh, evidence of having been uh, infected. The thing which I found uh, much more uh, of concern is not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, there were all these reports that uh, you might go along with very mild symptoms and then go down over the uh, over the uh, waterfall and uh, have trouble breathing, ending up in an ICU and maybe even ending up intubated. And since you don't know what the course of the disease is going to be, of course, you imagine the worst. Every time you cough, you worry that it's going to get worse. Uh, so I think the worry about the possible outcomes was, was worse than the symptoms that we experienced. So that's one point. The second point is that uh, we found it very difficult to get any medical attention at all. Uh, this was all happening in our case uh, in the uh, third week of March, something like the 17th or so. Um, and I called the doctor and said, can we make an appointment to be tested? We think this is COVID-19. And they said, no, you can't come in. And I said, why not? He said, because uh, we don't have adequate protection and we're afraid we'll get infected. But we're happy to have a video conference with you. And I'm sitting here saying, well, wait a minute. That's not how you practice medicine. You know, you're not getting pulse rate. You're not getting temperature. You're not getting, you know, heartbeat. Uh, you know, you're not getting anything. Um, so how the hell are you supposed to diagnose me? And I said, well, can I get a test somewhere? And they said, no. And, I, and then we finally got a doctor who tried to get us a test in um, Alexandria, uh, Virginia, which is in a different county than we live in. We live in Fairfax County. And they refused to accept us uh, at the testing facility because we weren't residents of uh, Alexandria, which pissed me off. Um, and my own doctor in Fairfax wouldn't take us. So we ended up paying $500 each for tests in a clinic in Washington, D.C. So we were confirmed as having COVID-19. And of course, at that point, the information does you absolutely no good whatsoever. Uh, it certainly tells you to, to isolate yourself and not infect anybody else. But there were no treatments. There was nothing. There was no vaccine. There is no palliative treatment. There's absolutely nothing. So uh, we just lived through it, uh, fortunately, with fairly mild symptoms, as they say. Uh, but it clearly indicates how uh, broken a lot of our infrastructure is right now. 
uh, and it's exacerbated by the fact that we can't meet face to face. I mean, think of all the various things that you rely on that involve people who are in, in, adjacent to each other, whether it's getting a haircut, which I finally got after two months. Uh, so, you know, it's not as bad as it was. Uh, I was thinking of growing a ponytail and thinking this might go on for more months. And I've never done that. I mean, I've never had hair that long. So um, it was also very clear that the supply chain was broken with regard to uh, test equipment uh, or you know, protective equipment and also test equipment, whether it's reagents for the test or even something you know, like the thing that they stick in your nose in order to get a sample. The swab uh, were, the swabs weren't available. Testing facilities weren't available. And this was just three months ago. Uh, then, so we started looking at the general uh, condition of supply chain, and it was clearly uh, not well planned for, for this kind of a, uh, a pandemic. And then, of course, the sequestration uh, lost people, literally tens of millions of people, their, their jobs, at least temporarily. So uh, the economic <clears throat> side effect of this has also uh, been very dramatic. What this tells me is that we have a long way to go to prepare ourselves for future crises, not just pandemics, but other things that we uh, can anticipate, one of which, of course, is global warming, which is a huge challenge all by itself. Last point, I think, is that um, it's fairly astonishing that the Internet has managed to hold up as well as it has. But it also tells us that we have enormous uh, work ahead of us to get 50 percent of the world's population online or at least giving them the option for being online uh, who are not yet uh, able to get direct access to the internet. So uh, this entire experience uh, has uh, shown a very, very bright spotlight on many different parts of our economic uh, infrastructure and our, our mechanical infrastructure that tells me we have a lot of work to do. Uh, you're, Sorry, Mehmet, uh, you're muted, or at least I can't hear you. I'm back with the, my, my, my sound. Great. Thank you so much, Vint. Uh, this was a great answer. And, you know, I'm so glad to see you healthy. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're healthy, even though you, you, know, you didn't have the symptoms. You travel so much. So, you know, you're one of the few people that I got worried immediately because I was myself, you know, when this pandemic actually became a big issue, uh, around the world. I was in Brazil myself, so I had some issues going back to the United States myself. Uh, back to the, the, the demand on internet. Of course, demand of internet has grown significantly. Not only we are only using internet for uh, entertainment, but now it's part of our daily lives. We work from home, most of us. As you are working from your, uh, your home office, I believe. Did you have any internet problems when uh, you shifted from working from uh, you know, multiple locations or an office to your home? And how did you solve those problems if you had anything? Well, actually, I haven't had any problem. I have what appears to be a pretty good service. Um, and, and although I often am not, I'm not tempted to say any uh, very many good things about Verizon. I will say that the Fios <laughs> did turn out to work well, and I am not complaining about it. We've had a couple of power failures, but I have a 50 kilobit, gener a kil yeah, kilobit, a 50 kilowatt generator in the backyard. And so that takes care of everything in the house, including uh, all of the internet equipment. I have multiple Wi-Fi relays scattered around the house. Uh, and so uh, this has actually been more convenient than traveling. Uh, you and I both have the experience of traveling hundreds of thousands of miles a year. And I have not traveled at all since the middle of March. It's March 12th that I returned from London uh, after a 10 day stay where I most certainly picked up COVID-19. Uh, I have not traveled since that time, uh, hardly been out of the house, uh, except for taking walks around the park uh, and uh, and cooking in the barbecue. So, uh, which by the way, is one of the side effects of, uh, of being at home. I end up with cooking duties that I didn't used to have uh, when I was traveling all the time. So, uh, so that's been interesting. And of course my wife and I, have uh, had a chance to you know, spend more time together than I normally would since I was out of the house about three weeks out of four uh, in my normal travel schedule. Uh, and I guess the other point uh, that many people know, I have a wine cellar and uh, it's about 15 feet from where I'm sitting right, sit, sitting right now in my office. 
uh, with a couple of thousand bottles of wine. And so uh, we don't even have to go to the store uh, to <laughs> find a bottle uh, to have for dinner. Uh, so this is, uh, and on top of that, uh, this online um, engagement has turned out to be super convenient. You know, I have done uh, maybe four or five video uh, conferences today, uh, bouncing around between Europe and the US and Australia. Uh, and the, I guess the point here is that I didn't have to wait, you know, fly 22 hours to get somewhere. Yeah. So the overhead of travel has, has been highlighted by comparison with working from my office, switching uh, from one uh, conference call to another. So except for the for not actually having the kind of personal interactions that you have, a meal together, sharing a bottle of wine, um, this has actually been very efficient. And so I'm lucky to be able to work that way. Not everyone can. Uh, and uh, so I, I suspected this style of work is going to uh, continue even after the pandemic is over uh, because of the efficiency of it all. And it will, it will certainly change the way in which business thinks about how to uh, employ people uh, and how to put them to work uh, if they don't necessarily have to be physically in the same place, at least not all the time. This was one of the questions, actually, uh, you know, over this last week, since we confirmed this interview date, we've been asking our uh, users at Infrapedia to kind of send us some questions. And one of the questions we received, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the person right now, but I, I, the full name, but the name was Mark. Uh, he asked us, what are the some positive effects of COVID-19 since the pandemic has happened? And I myself, you know, I am also not traveling just like yourself. It gives me a lot of time, say, from traveling, but also a lot of people that daily commute seems to be enjoying more times with their families. Everybody is doing, you know, a little bit of a walk with the family in the afternoons, a little bit more neighborhood communication, I guess, because, you know, you can't always, uh, you know, find everything you need 24 hours. Maybe your communication becomes better with your uh, neighbors. What are some of the things that you can highlight uh in your life that COVID-19 positively affect? We want to we wanna make this call positive. We want to make this in a positive side. Well, there, there will be positive outcomes. Um, and uh, like you, I've encountered neighbors that I normally would not see. Um, and we stop and chat suitably distanced from each other. Uh, so I've gotten to know a few people in the neighborhood that I otherwise would not have met. Many of us are out there walking the dog or just taking a walk. There's something else that I found quite intriguing. Um, the fact that I'm home all the time at the moment means that every time I take a walk, uh, each day I am watching springtime. And, you know, normally I'd be away for three weeks and home for one. And so I didn't see the progression of the flowers blooming, for example. And this seems like a simple thing, but I've been watching them bloom sequentially. Uh, and so it's actually been a lot of fun every single day to go find out whether the buds have blossomed uh, and where, or even predict uh, where they will be. I've been taking photographs of all the various uh, plants in, in our garden. Um, and I never had time to do that. And I never appreciated the, um, uh, you know, the planning that goes into a garden where you want the plants to uh, bloom sequentially so that there's always some color somewhere. Yes. And so I, I had to you know, thank our landscapers for having planned the garden to not bloom all at once, but to bloom over a period of months. Uh, and now, now I'm anticipating uh, blooms that aren't quite ready yet, like the rhododendrons and things like that. Sometimes I didn't even know the name of the flower, uh, and I still don't know the names of all of them. But I, I, somebody gave me a little uh, bi uh, botany book, and I've been leafing my way through or using uh, Google Lens as a, you know, take a picture of the flower and say, what is it? And often it's able to come back and say, this is what it looks like. So I learned about one called an allium, which looks like a, um, an exploding um, uh, fireworks. It's a spherical flower. It's absolutely beautiful. And it looks like fireworks. Uh, and so I discovered that I know what it is now. It's called an allium. And I'm glad we have a lot of them. <laughs> Fantastic. One of the questions we received uh, uh, rega was regarding the coronavirus vaccine and GDPR. You made some comments about this. I think it's very important 
uh, that people understand it. There are pros and cons of GDPR. Uh, I myself was uh, at Microsoft when the GDPR first came along and the preparation and I, then I went to Yahoo. It was a huge work. You know, anybody that is hosting global companies, a lot of data storage, it's a huge work. But Vint, we would like to hear from you, uh, your thoughts about how this GDPR and similar, you know, data sovereignty laws could affect coronavirus vaccine development or any other medicine development. So this is not an argument against trying to protect privacy at all. And so I'm not, uh, not trying to be anti-GDPR. Um, what I was thinking about, though, is the evidence which has now uh, made manifest that um, the sharing of medical information has helped us advance our understanding of this disease and our uh, attempts to find a, a cure or at least a vaccine. So um, the big worry here is that understanding this disease it requires us to know a lot about a lot of different people who've been infected. And getting access to medical records is an issue. In, here in the U.S., we have something called HIPAA, yes. which is, I forget what the acronym stands for, but mostly it has to do with protecting personal information that's health-related. And GDPR, of course, is aimed in a similar way at trying to protect personal information. The thing is that we need to be able to share that information and aggregate it somehow. Yeah. We, may not need, we may need to separate the personal information from the other data, um, but the, uh, you and I and many of your uh, listeners uh, are well aware, I think, that even if you think you have anonymized the database, yeah. uh, if anyone gets their hands on that data and then has additional information available, they may be able yeah. to re-derive or de-anonymize the information. And you can imagine uh, the GDPR or some of the other uh, legal uh, systems uh, would put... Um, you put the party um, who did that uh, in, at risk. Um, I'm not arguing in favor of de-anonymizing. What I'm saying is that if the in intent is to share medical information and there is resistance to sharing it because of the potential for de-anonymization, we may not um, be able to get aggregate that information and use it in order to figure out, first of all, what is the course of this disease what organs does it affect and in what sequence? Uh, how, you know, what kinds of um, interventions might there be and at what stage uh, in the uh, disease? So my, my comment was not deep, not intended to be very deep, but it was to say we should be thoughtful about uh, over exercising, over exercising uh, privacy concerns if in fact the consequences of that are that we don't know how to fight this particular pandemic. Thank you, Vince. Thanks for explaining that. And I think that uh, I have started reading more about this and you're not the only one who's feeling this way. And there are a lot of people sharing similar concerns. Uh, Vince, when is your next travel? That's, that's a question we just received from, from actually Google, uh, YouTube. Uh, let's see, when is your next travel? Well, actually, it's not clear at all. Um, all the meetings that are scheduled <clears throat> out to September have all been canceled or turned into virtual meetings. The, uh, the, the one which is still on the calendar is uh, Katowice in Poland to the Internet Governance Forum. But I am willing to wager that even that will turn um, virtual. Uh, for the simple reason that we may not have a vaccine, or even if we have one, we won't have enough uh, produced in order to uh, assure people who are gathering uh, in a large conference, there would be two or 3,000 people, Absolutely. Uh, to assure them that they are protected uh, from uh, exposure. And even though it appears to be the case that um, a small fraction of people are severely affected by COVID-19, uh, you don't know whether you fall into that category or not. In my case, uh, I'm age 77, or I will be in a couple of weeks. And so I'm up on the on the far end of the risk factor uh, because of age and other uh, other medical conditions. And so I would not be favorable uh, to go to a meeting like that uh, if it turned out that, uh, that I was putting myself at risk. Now, we definitely don't want you to put yourself on a, on a risk. Um, I would like to ask a question more general about uh, about the technology. 
So with everybody working from home, with companies like Google, with you know, being very relaxed, very understanding about letting people work from home, do you think that do you have different expectations in the future that you didn't have, let's say, last year about the development of internet technologies? Do you expect anything new that we don't have today uh, to be developed to help us communicate and connect better remotely? Yes. Uh, and uh, to go back to my earlier comments about the resistance of the medical community to have me show up in person, uh, this uh, drove a lot of thinking about medical devices, uh, remote sensing devices that would allow uh, a doctor to get at least basic information about a patient's uh, condition, uh, even if they're not physically in the office. And so having a uh, an audio video conference with a patient and gathering uh, basic information about the patient's condition uh, using remote sensing devices seems to me a very natural uh, outcome. And that would be good in any case, because yeah. for, you know, telemedicine has been a desirable capacity for a long time, especially in places where uh, there are, is inadequate uh, medical care. Um, in or, but of course, in order for this to work, you'd have to have uh, electricity and you have to have internet access. Uh, plus the devices themselves to do the sensing. Uh, but I am confident uh, that, that we will see uh, an, an initiative to make it possible to do this kind of remote diagnosis, uh, and, and especially now that um, we realize that we can do at least the, the conferencing part uh, and that uh, it is a, a natural reaction to uh, not having uh, adequate protective equipment but even if we did have adequate equipment, it might very well be that it's much more efficient for a simple triage anyway, uh, to do this kind of a, a remote uh, diagnosis uh, for, uh, for patients before you actually have them come into a clinic or a hospital or the doctor's office. So there's that aspect. The other thing which um, I'm anticipating is that uh, at Google, of course, we closed all the offices and so people had to work from home. Uh, we encountered several things that uh, needed to be considered anyway, uh, it, not necessarily all solved, but one of them is do you have adequate equipment for working at home? Do you have comfortable chair, desk? Do you have, do you have a place where you can quiet, be quiet? Can you close the door? Uh, do you have room, uh, you have a room? Do you have a place that doesn't look too bad from you know the standpoint of having a video conference? Uh, that's being overcome by having artificial backgrounds uh, for some of the conferencing systems. Although I, those of you who, who have tried that will notice that depending on what you wear, uh, that artificial background may or may not work. And sometimes, you know, your your head is uh, distorted by uh, yeah. the color coding and the filtering. Um, some people are investing in green screens uh, to, you know, just a, like a, a, a typical, um, uh, screen that you would used to put up, you know, for showing slides and things like that. You could just drape this uh, specific uh, green or blue color uh, behind you. Um, but then you have to have the cooperation of the of the software that processes yeah. the video in order to put something in the background. Yeah. Uh, in my case, uh, you're seeing the ego wall. Uh, and <laughs> that, that is the only presentable part of my office. If I were to show you the rest of the office, which I'm not going to do, uh, you would see stacks of books, um, some of them four feet high, um, that are, are piled up because there's no place else to put them. Uh, they come in on average one a day. And uh, with you know asking for blurbs on the cover or a preface or something else. So um, anyway, I think we're going to see um, if this persists as a normal um, choice for work, not that it's forced, but that it's that you're given choice, then uh, you may very well see uh, people trying to adapt their homes uh, to a workspace that's suitable for this kind of video conferencing and remote effort. Uh, so outfitting <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the uh, employees with the proper equipment uh, having adequate uh, capacity, not only for you and the video conferencing you might do, but what about the kids that are also online taking classes? And what about, uh, you know, uh, Aunt Nellie who wants to watch streaming Netflix all at the same time? 
So there's going to be a lot of demand for capacity in both directions. Right. Uh, those are the immediate kinds of things that I think of. I will point out one other thing, which I don't know what to do about. Uh, if you've ever experienced an in-person meeting where it's exclusively in-person, uh, you sort of have a, the ability to judge what's going on. You see people's expressions, you see their body language. Uh, you can interrupt each other because you signal that you want to interrupt. Um, that works in a room size kind of meeting. Um, uh, you can almost get some of these capabilities with the kind of meeting that we're having right now. If you have a grid view of all of the participants and you can see somebody raise their hand or you use an artificial tool for hand raising, uh, you know, a computer based tool for that. If, if it's either all in person or all remote, you can kind of make this work. If it's a mix, a hybrid of some people local and some people remote, it's much, much harder to get the dynamics right. to work well. And so I think we were going to struggle with that. Somebody told me um, this morning that they had an idea about doing exhibitions online. Now, I want you to think a little bit about this. Normally, when you go to an exhibition, it's a big noisy hall. Lots of people have their little turf and, and they're demonstrating their uh, equipment or product or whatever it is. Uh, and they have to do something to attract attention. Uh, it, you know, because people just wander around in this giant room and, and they're looking for something that looks interesting. And so, you know, some of the exhibitors will take advantage of scantily clad women or something in order to get attention of the, of the guys anyway. Uh, so the question is, how would you organize a remote exhibition? Now, it could, you know, you know sort of the grid view thing where things are going on and, you're, and your attention is attracted to one or another of the things happening in the grid. But the, the thing which I find interesting about contemplating this is that the thing which you want to show might not be something easily transported to a, uh, uh, an exhibition hall. Maybe it's too big, you know, phys just literally physically too big. Um, and so you might actually get some advantage out of a remote exhibition to show things that you couldn't actually show in, in one that where people were showing up face to face. It's a little harder to hand out samples of things. Uh, and so you, you can see that it would not be exactly the same, but you can imagine where there might be some utility and some advantage in, in this, one of which is cost. Yes. Because uh, you, you know having to ship equipment and get it installed and then deinstall it, make sure it works on the net and everything else maybe a lot more expensive than being able to do everything from uh, the uh, you know, home office of the company. You're absolutely right. I think that also people didn't necessarily in the past realize the importance of maybe online marketing and making shows like this to connect people. And I think that more and more people will uh, actually be doing one of the next episode I'm going to be shooting later this week is to talk about how Anybody can start their own, uh, you know, live streaming like this. I've spent quite a bit of time, almost two months, trying to, you know, make it right. And, you know, connecting Zoom with YouTube and the camera and this card. I think that, you know, once people get to know all these details and understand, look, I don't have to ship anything. I don't have to do anything except shooting a right video with the right angle, with the nice information and maybe multi-language so that everybody can understand I can expand the new markets. You're absolutely right. We are receiving a lot of questions online, so I would like to go through those if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, the, the concept we have here is direct interaction, okay? So one of the questions, the interesting one, what is taking most of your time, Vint? What projects that you can let us know, what's taking most of Vint Surf's time nowadays? So uh, some of you uh, know that I've been at Google now for almost 15 years. Uh, by October, uh, I'll have my 15th anniversary. Uh, when I joined the company, I joined in the research department and then uh, stayed there for uh, pretty much about 12 years or so. Then I moved into a policy group because a lot of what I do at Google does, does involve policy, especially international policy, sometimes domestic policy with regard to internet in particular. Uh, and then uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, my team and I moved into uh, the cloud uh, operation at Google. Um, part of the reason for that is that uh, we're very interested in what's called the public sector, both you know, federal, state, and local. 
businesses or, or state and local federal uh, agencies, state and local and federal agencies, uh, and uh, serving their needs in the cloud environment. And since I've been in Washington, D.C. for 44 years now, um, I have you know reasonable uh, connections uh, with uh, the uh, current and previous administrations. So I'm focused uh, on, um, on growing the uh, public sector business um, uh, in that team. Uh, however, I continue to be, uh, you know, the uh, chief internet evangelist at Google. Um, uh, and that uh, involves the policy related things that it used to involve a lot of travel. Uh, now it involves a lot of video conferencing. Uh, so that's sort of the, the overall uh, shape of, uh, of the scope of what I'm doing. I'm still very active in a number of non-Google um, entities, and one of which is uh, the Department of Commerce National Institutes of Standards and Technology. So I sit again on the Visiting Committee for Advanced Technology, which I used to chair uh, some uh, years ago. Uh, I am also a special government employee for NASA, specifically at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and also sitting on the NASA Advisory Committee advising the director of the uh, science mission directorate, which of, of course is infinitely exciting because I get to hear about the, uh, both the um, plans for uh, near-term missions, the return to the moon, Artemis and Gateway, and then the longer-term missions to Mars, and also speculative uh, questions about getting to the outer planets, uh, in, you know, and looking at uh, uh, oceans that are underneath the surface of some of the uh, more distant planets. So, uh, and I'm still chairing uh, the Marconi Society. I stepped down as chair of the People-Centered Internet. I'm still chairing the in, uh, Innovation for Jobs group. So yeah, I have lots and lots of, of activities that um, keep me busy and which Google permits me to, uh, uh, to work on. Uh, one point that I'm particularly pleased to report is that the interplanetary extension of the internet is now uh, you know, well underway. Uh, we've gone from the development phase to the to the deployment phase to implementation, and so it's on the International Space Station. Prototypes are still on Mars, uh, and, uh, and we are in the process of uh, of uh, deploying the most recent standardized protocols for interplanetary communication uh, in order to serve the uh, uh, upcoming missions to the Moon. So. Uh, it's really very satisfying. So life is good. It's filled with uh, with all kinds of uh, different activities, which uh, which keeps certainly keeps me from being bored. Vint, you are one of the most uh, inspiring person I have ever met in my life. And you know, I have met with you many many years ago when I was a you know engineer at ICANN. You will remember Steve Conte, of course. You know John Crane, and you know working working for you in those meetings when you were chairman of ICANN. I have some I can questions, but I, I don't want to change that topic yet. I have actually a lot of I can and dot org questions, but <laughs> okay. I want I want I want to ask a question from David Zimmer as reach out <laughs> to me. And he would like to ask your opinion on during this pandemic, there were a lot of students who did not have computers, who did not have internet access that end up spending a lot of time in Starbucks and libraries. What can we do to make an immediate attempt to computerize or enable internet for many, many millions that even in the United States, we are a well-developed country. However, you know, even in, a, in anywhere in the United States, the students are struggling. Not, it's not just about being home, right? But not having internet access in some homes. What are your some of your thoughts? And you're very well connected, both from a, you know a Fortune 500, a big Fortune 500, who invest a lot on internet and does a lot of good for the community, but at the same time from government side as well, well respected. What is what are some of the things that we can uh, do to close that gap? There seems to be a big gap. Uh, in, indeed, there is. I mean, uh, look, uh, the statistics still say that half the world's population doesn't have direct access to the internet despite the fact that we have mobile phones all over everywhere, many of which are smartphones, and we have 3G and 4G and perhaps soon 5G. Um, so there are several things that you, you put together quite a few pieces, so let's uh, unpack this. Uh, with regard to physical equipment to get access to the internet, we need to drive cost out. And at Google, we have tried to do that with the Chromebook, for example. 
uh, which has a number of useful properties, one of which is that uh, it doesn't do very much by itself because a lot of what it does is out in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, so that um, driving cost out is important because for many of the people who don't have access to equipment, it's because of cost. Uh, that same argument can be made with regard to access to the internet itself. The cost of access could be uh, prohibitive. Um, I have been working uh, through the people-centered internet and more recently the Marconi Society on the, the challenge of getting internet into the hands of people in Native American reservations in the United States and more generally in rural areas that are uh, poorly served uh, by e the existing incumbents. Um, and so in those cases, cost is a very, very uh, critical uh, problem. And so uh, some of the groups that we've been working with are trying to drive the cost down to, you know, a dollar or two a month for reasonable access to the internet. Now, the question is what's reasonable and as time goes on, more and more bandwidth seems to be needed to do anything. An example of what we're doing right now, watching streaming video, watching class, yeah. classes, for example, in a streaming video way, uh, requires more, <clears throat> more bandwidth. Um, so in the US, <clears throat> there is this concept of universal service. Historically, that was all about electricity and uh, specifically tele telephone service. At this uh, stage in the 21st century, it should mean broadband access to the internet. Yeah. We could argue over what broadband means, but personally, I think it's a you know, minimum of 100 megabits a second and up. Uh, for some people, it should be a gigabit per second. That's hard to do unless you have end-to-end uh, -end fiber. Uh, although, I must say, um, I've learned about um, a, we'll call it a product, it's, uh, it's actually a prototype of a, a laser point-to-point -point laser system, which costs about, at, you know, in small quantities, costs about $50,000 for a pair of lasers. So this is not cheap, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than digging a trench and, and pulling fiber. It has the ability to run somewhere in the range of one to 10 gigabits a second over a distance of uh, somewhere between one and 10 miles. So I'm sorry, I'm, I may be worrying about that. It might be one to 10 kilometers. Yeah, don't kill me if I've got that off by, <laughs> by 0.6. Um, in any event, though, that, uh, that's a very reasonable cost for the distance that we're, and the bandwidth we're talking about. Uh, and so that suggests that the middle mile, for example, might be solvable using lasers. And they've told me that, um, that in quantity, you might be able to drive the cost of, of such a capacity down to about $25,000 for the pair of, of uh, lasers. So I don't mean to put everything on that. That's just yeah. an example. Elon Musk's Starlink, of course, is yes. another major initiative. Uh, he just launched another 60 uh, satellites. So they're about on the order of 180. I am one of the advisors of Starlink project. I actually work with them actively with the Starlink team, uh, you know, with Infrapedia. They love Infrapedia. They use actually our transparent platform to find the sites and to select the providers, find the diversity. And, you know, I must say one of the things that really makes me excited about projects like with low orbit satellite projects is that when you earlier mentioned the 2 billion people that is not connected, 50% of people that is not connected. You know, we, that is the only way we can connect them because it's true that we can't put fiber probably everywhere in the world. Well, uh, one thing, even though we have a lot of under, underwater fiber, stringing fiber on the surface doesn't work very well. So, uh, yeah. and yeah, boats going along, they have to keep pulling the fiber with them. And it doesn't work we very well. We have a question related to this so okay, fiber right. doesn't go anywhere last mile is now becoming you know 5g is coming and up and coming or it's, it's already here there are a lot of rumors about 5g and COVID 19 there's a lot of you know i just i just want to say ridiculous if i may you know what are your thoughts about 5g is 5g going to change everything we know or is it going to be a revolution like the way the revolu you know the revolution has happened from dial up to uh, fiber optics what are your thoughts about that well first of all um i don't see this as revolutionary as some people do uh it's an increase in capacity and that's good news um, however depending on what frequencies you're operating at you may require uh, base stations to be much closer together and that implies connecting them by fiber 
uh, which you know puts you back into the loop again of how much does it cost to dig up the street and pull the fiber or put up poles and, and hang the fiber. So, um, so the, you, you know, it, it's not 100% clear yet how the economics of 5G will work out. Uh, 5G is more than just about frequency. Um, in fact, there's quite a, a big um, debate about at which, which frequencies we should be running the 5G design. And some people were looking at 28 gigahertz, which has the advantage of allowing you a very big chunk of bandwidth, uh, which sh should increase the data rates that you can deliver. The problem with that particular um, choice, though, is that the rest of the world out, outside of the US seems to be moving towards six gigahertz and below, uh, which collides with some other uses of that uh, frequency, but which has the advantage of not requiring the base stations to be quite so close together uh, and has the disadvantage of not necessarily delivering uh, the same kind of capacity that the 28 gigahertz does. If you're in the US and you're making 5G capability and everybody else in the world is doing 60 gigahertz, then you're going to have to build equipment to serve both frequencies if the US is focused on 28. I think we've shifted our view now and we're looking at 6 gigahertz uh, as well as uh, others outside the US. So um, the more important thing about 5G, though, is that uh, it is um, it requires a very complex interface, the control plane of 5G has a lot of knobs on it. Uh, and it is reminiscent um, of earlier attempts at doing uh, what the telcos used to call um, intelligent, uh, it was IA, or oh, IM, it was intelligent networks, uh, which was supposed to give you highly differential services available to, so the user or the intermediary could control the characteristics of the service that, that was obtained from the intelligent network. And then that didn't work. So they had advanced intelligent networks and that didn't work very well. Then there was frame relay and ATM and all this other stuff. Uh, so 5G comes with a fairly complex control plane and you can't get to it without going through the physical control plane. There isn't any other way to get down to it from the internet protocol layer, for example. So 5G has a whole lot of implications, not the least of which, um, it may involve uh, international considerations. Uh, and anyone who's following this, of course, knows that there's been a lot of tension about the Huawei offering of 5G versus others and concerns about potential abuse of control over the 5G system. So I think there are many questions in my mind about how well 5G is going to work and how well it will be received um, and, uh, and whether it will in fact deliver on the promises that many people are making about the 5G world, but it can't be the only means of access to the internet because it, the, the fiber still dominates. And of course, as you point out, we still don't yet know what's going to happen with the uh, Starlink. Yes. Vince, so we have, we are getting a lot of questions. I would like to go through these really quick with you. Um, do you remember you are you're one of the uh, most gentleman person also you know not only always dressed perfectly but very gentleman very thoughtful one thing that actually my wife made me remember this morning when i you know was talking about you that the flowers that you sent to my home after the nsx ceremony i don't know if you remember that many years ago in 2011 after finding out i was away from home the only saw my wife for once uh, for six months so we are really grateful of that one of the questions that we receive is about the nsf in terms of internet security privacy in, more on the dns side um you know do you think the nsf achieved what it was intended to achieve or well, the it, development it, deployment of the nsf do you think is it going well or it, it could have been better what are your thoughts it, about it? It need more, we need to implement more of it, for one thing. We also, uh, and so Steve Crocker, by the way, has been a great proponent for DNSSEC. He certainly uh, exercised that uh, enthusiasm as chairman of ICANN and continues to work in that space. Uh, and I uh, share his, uh, his interest in getting it implemented. Uh, Dane is an, a, an offshoot, uh, which is also very attractive for cryptographic variables and end to end uh, security. Uh, I will argue, however, that we also need RPKI. We need some secure version of BGP. I mean, there is there is a constellation of 
functionality that we really should have everywhere, if at all possible. And our challenge has been to provide incentive for yeah. actually implementing this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you know, one one could hope, for example, that government procurement would drive some of the incentive. Uh, but I'd love it if uh, if uh, the private sector would do the same. Now, at Google, we tried very hard to get V6 uh, out the door. We implemented V6 yeah. internally. We made most of our services available on IPv6. I think all of them now are largely available that way uh, in order to be part of the community that encouraged V6 implementation. Uh, but with regard to DNSSEC, I would like very much to see this become the norm. And if, we, if you if you get a domain name, you automatically get enrolled in DNSSEC. Uh, and uh, if you get an IP address, uh, you automatically get enrolled in an RPKI program. Uh, all of those things are really important to achieve a, uh, a higher level of safety and security than we have today. This is basically what I tell when somebody asks me, you know, can you use an analogy to explain DNSSEC and you know, IPv6 and then some other forms? I'm just basically using, hey, when you buy a car, you know, do you actually ask whether it has, uh, you know, automatic or manual? Nowadays, everything automatic, right? Very rare you can buy manual or, hey, does this have ABS brakes? It's, it's just there. I think DNSSEC, IPv6 should just be there by default. We have very good engineers that can implement that. All right, Vint, we are uh, we have about four minutes left. I want to respect your time. We have still have a lot of people watching, but also a lot of questions are coming. Um, so, an ICANN question for you, as the old chairman of ICANN, coming from a former uh, ICANN staff, did ICANN lose its mission? Do, where do you think ICANN is going nowadays? after many years being very impactful, developing DNS, DNSSEC, IPv6 policies around the world with this last.org, may I say fiasco or may I say miscommunication? I don't want to use a wrong word as you know, English is my not second, but third language. But I want to be like, what do you think about ICANN? What because I'm seeing nothing but non-positive things. And it hurts me as a former staff who was mm -hmm. spent his youth. You know, ICANN brought me to the United States. I was living outside. I was living in Puerto Rico. They invested me a lot. And it kind of hurts me to hear non-positive things over and over. What well, do you think? Is this a misunderstanding? Is it just, you know, some politics? Because, you know, what ICANN does is right, but it's impacting so many big companies now so lobbying happening you are i think one of the voices that can give a clear answer to this i would like to hear your response well first of all ICANN is operating in a more complex environment now than it ever was i mean because the internet has become so important and covid19 has simply exacerbated that uh, the other thing is that um, ICANN is a very complicated object I mean, if you if you look at its processes and procedures and its style, uh, whenever anything happens that you know in, uh, can't be solved by the existing apparatus, they invent yet another council or a committee, and then you have to figure out who, how will people be appointed to that, and how is that renewed? It's it, it many many. Uh, it reminds me of of the um, uh, misunderstanding of of the way orbits worked. Uh, when it, they had epicycles and they were trying to use just simple circles to account for the behavior of the planets around the sun. And of course, when we finally understood that they were in ellipsoidal, ellipsoidal uh, orbits rather than uh, in circular orbits, everything became much clearer. Oh, it also helped that we understood that they went around the sun, not around the earth. Um, so ICANN uh, has a, a history of, uh, of complexity, organizational complexity. Uh, however, I think that the current CEO is trying to focus the organization on doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and there are people who have been there for a long time. You mentioned John Crane. Uh, there's um, John Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, John Any is still there. Yeah. David, David is there. Um, yeah, David so, Conrad. Yeah, David Conrad, thank you. So, oh, and Teresa Swinehart uh, has just uh, been uh, elevated uh, and given more responsibility. So there are a lot of, of uh, old hands there, and I think they still understand and, and have internalized 
of the intent of ICANN, which is to create a playing field that people uh, can feel is fair and have, and have equal access to. Uh, but it's hard because this is a big business now. Yes. And whenever, whenever it's a big business, money is involved, lots of egos fly around, and there's different incentives and tensions and drivers for, uh, for behavior. So I consider it to be one of the more complex uh, organizations, even though its fundamental responsibility is easy to say, you know, which is to basically maintain the integrity of the unique identifiers of the internet. But because of the fact that they are both uh, monetizable and also are being um, are being, well, the, the platform, which they don't control. They don't control the internet. They just control or manage the, uh, the, the identifier space. And so they can't do, uh, they can't respond to a lot of the ills that show up in the internet environment. And so that's I agree why. with you. Sometimes people position ICANN in a different place than it is. Mission it's creep. We don't exactly. want mission creep, we want mission focus. Absolutely. So, and I think Goran has done a, a good job of trying to refocus the organization and stay stay focused on what it can do and what it should do, and to highlight what other people should do. Vint, one last question, and then I will let you go. I promise you. I hope it's okay. Do you still have time for one more last I have, question? I have one more minute. Yes. So, we believe as an engineer, uh, you know, who has always been engineer and still proud an engineer, transparency is very important as long as it doesn't affect security, national security, or safety of other, other companies. That's why we started Inferopedia, the platform, open source platform. We are also proud member of the Google startup program. So all of our infrastructure is in Google, Google Cloud. And thanks to Google, you know, we don't have to worry about spending machines or databases, CDNs. It's all donated by Google. So we are really grateful. And I would like to say special thank you for Ivan Phillips, who actually within Google, helped us to get that. Um, we believe in transparency. We would like, I would like to get your input on what else can be done because transparency brings resiliency, improves resiliency and stability of internet. And I believe we can have, we, we as internet grows, it's very important for us to have a reliable internet. Uh, any final comments? I would like to thank you once again. Any final comments about Infrapedia, you know, uh, and what other efforts out there that you know of mapping the internet, properly mapping the internet layer one infrastructure? Well, in fact, uh, the Marconi Society is in the middle of doing exactly this. It's working with Google and the MLAB program in order to map the functional uh, capacity of the network, it, uh, the, the performance that it gives to the users. And the purpose for that is to figure out where we need to shore up uh, the internet's capacity or to add it where it doesn't exist. That's a transparency argument, which I uh, absolutely concur with. Transparency is your friend. It's, it's your friend because it leads to accountability for one thing. And it also uh, opens people's eyes to opportunity. So uh, from my point of view, um, we really need to help people understand where the internet is and where it isn't and where it's not being served adequately in order to make that platform readily available, not only for consumers, but for people like you who start new businesses on top of that platform. Yes, yes. Well, I would like to thank you once again, Vint, for being first guest. And, uh, you know, we, we, will, we wish you a happy uh, rest of the year and hopefully more, more than healthy, you know, more healthy than you have ever been. Thank you so much, Vint. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, and I ended the stream. Thank you so much. Take care.